Welcome back to The Chosen Journey with Big Money Grip, Steve Carse and Chosen Lawyer. On today's episode, I have talked about this in many episodes before and saying, Steve Carse, it's time to make that comeback. I know that arm is fresh. I know we can do it. Steve's like, no, 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 I'm done. Today's guest, if he cannot motivate Steve to come back on the pitching mound, nobody will be able to. The man that will be known to the end of time as the rookie, Mr. Jim Morris. Jim, welcome to The Chosen Journey. Thank you, sir. I feel pretty old for a rookie. <laughs> You're going to be 125 and in probably in a, in a nursing home, and they're still going to call you the rookie. This is going to be till the end. You know what? It's not a bad nickname if you think about it. It's true, unless I'm messing up something and they call me a rookie because I'm screwing it up. But other than that, yeah, I'm good. One of the first questions I have to ask you, because I can tell you that if Disney came around and made a movie about me, that – that movie would be on repeat on my house on the DVD or PVR nonstop. I'd have posters everywhere of it. If I come into your home now, is there any trace of the movie, the rookie? Very few. Um, it's one thing to go through it, but the rookie is not who I am. I'm, I'm me. I'm Jim Morris. That's just something I did. And so to sit there and go, and my kids had to put up with a lot growing up. Because we're on TV, people are driving by our house in the front yard, taking pictures, and my kids are like, what is going on? They have no concept of it because they're little at the time. Very few rookie things. I got a rookie poster, and I got a chair from the movie set, and that's basically it. And I don't watch the movie. I watched it being filmed. They filmed it from the end to the beginning, so as a baseball player, that confused me, and I like, how do they do that? And then they go, hey, we want you to come see the movie. It's finished. And so Sean and I go out to Burbank and we watch the movie. And three and a half hours later, they're like, what do you think? I'm like, well, it's in black and white. There's no music. There's some sound gaffes. Um, awesome. I don't know. And then two weeks later, I'm in Nashville doing a religious broadcasters convention in Nashville. And I have to talk after this group of media watch this movie. And I had to quit crying before I could go down there. I mean, it was just, it's one thing to live it, but then to sit back and look at all the decisions and things that had to line up just right. Overwhelming. And still to this day, 59 in two weeks and go, did that really happen? And all that entailed with that, hanging out with Dennis, flying on Disney's jet and everything that went along with that was awesome. And it especially sucks now because you have to fly commercial and who doesn't want to get on a, a jet with mickey mouse ears on the seats and everything else but they live in a different world than we live in and this is this is the real world and things happen good and bad and our job is to analyze that study it and learn from it and hopefully we did that hopefully we taught our kids that and disney doing the movie was a was an honor for me and but Dennis and I still have a friendship to this day, and that means more to me than the movie or anything else. And I know he wrote yeah, the forward. That's, Go ahead, Steve. No, I was gonna say that's 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 great. I mean, I just I think everybody uh kind of wants to know if you could take us to you know uh back in the day of how you how it transpired, how you got to get back into it and uh you know be the rookie so to speak you know you said you were a teacher um you know there are some things that obviously i've read and heard about how some uh of of the people within your life was was pushing you a little bit to try to come back after seeing uh you throw a little bit i mean we all know uh in the baseball world how talented you have to be to reach that level and uh you know i just you know, it's a chosen journey, right? It's a journey for you. So I think everybody would want to know how you got to that point. And then, uh, you know, just kind of go into uh, the way it transpired and then um, take us through till it finished. All right. Brownwood, Texas High School. Our football coach hates baseball. I'd rather watch grass grow than watch a baseball game. No high school baseball team. So I'm relegated to 10 games a summer. I'm striking out everybody. I'm like, I am good. And then I realized everybody's hauling hay and they can't swing the bat because they're so tired. And I'm like, I am not good. And I 
go to my first spring training, get drafted by the Brewers, supplemental draft January of 1983. And I get to my first spring training. I pull up in the parking lot. There's a hundred guys there. And I'm like, hey, the whole organization here, that is awesome. I have no clue. That was just the pitchers. And I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and for the next five and a half years, six surgeries by 24, I'm out of uh, minor league baseball. And I threw 89, 90 when I was in high school during summer league. But now the first couple of years of baseball, I think my elbow's already injured and I'm going to need Tommy John. But at that time I'm throwing 84, 85, 86. And I'm like, I'm just like any other lefty up here. I need something different, but it never happened. So at 24, I'm in Dr. James Andrews office in Birmingham. And he goes, I can fix it and you can go back out on the field. But the decision is yours. I said, it's time for me to grow up. I'm going to go home. Eventually, I meet somebody, get married, start a family, buy a house, get a dog, grow up. That's my plan. He goes, a great plan. Start with the dog. Mm -hmm. All right. And then I go to college. I go, if I can't play the game I love. Maybe I can teach it. And so that's what I started working towards. Mm -hmm. All my science classes excelled on my baseball teams. One, I get to Big Lake. I inherit a team mm -hmm. who had won three games each year. One game each year for the three years before I get there. So you'll appreciate this. I kept that team on the schedule because I'm going to get one win. The next thing I found out was that we had eight kids show up. Eight is not enough for a baseball team. <laughs> so I offered a free A in science to anybody play for me, and I had two takers. They made straight A's, and they could not play. That gave us 10 kids. And for me, my dad being in the military, going up on the West Coast and the East Coast, baseball, since I was five, I – I watched Vita Blue in Oakland. I watched Dravecki. I watched Louis Tion. I watched Fred Lynn. I watched Dwight Evans and all these people. Who are baseball? Dave Rigetti, Ron Guidry. And I thought, this is what I want to do, even from the time I was a little kid. But that's not what I could teach these kids. I couldn't teach them about the history of the game until I taught them about themselves first. And so we learn to take care of our field. That's our home. That's where people come and try to beat us. And we're going to take care of it. We're going to manicure it. We're going to redo it every single day. And we're going to do what it takes because this is, this is our home. And I said, the jerseys you have on your back, I said, the school's on there. So you represent your school. You're on city field. You represent the city. You represent the name of your family. We represent a whole lot more than we think we do. And my grandfather always taught me, you can't respect anybody else till you respect yourself first. And so we learned about respect. We learned how to wear our uniforms, right? We learned how to study. We learned how to open doors for teachers. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, turn our homework in. That was quite an undertaking, not so much for me, but for them, because they'd always done whatever they wanted. And so learning what we learned, we're not gonna talk to the other team. That's gonna fire them up. It's gonna make us look bad. If you lose, then you really get it. I said, the only thing we're going to say to each other during the game is how to build each other up, not tear each other down. Nobody's trying to give up an error. Nobody's trying to make an error. Nobody's trying to give up a home run. We're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to win. And so we're going to close our mouths. Nobody's going to win with the umpire. You let me lose the umpire. You guys play the game. Ten games that first year, we were 10-0 at home. Second season at this small school in West Texas, I have 63 kids come out from my baseball team. And I'm like, now we're talking. Now I got a varsity, a JV, and a couple of freshman teams. They had heard a coach talking to me in 1999 where the movie takes place, the story takes place, who told me, you've taken these kids as far as you can. These kids are losers. Their parents are losers. They're never going anywhere. And then he put his finger in my chest and he goes, you might be a great baseball coach, but you're always going to come in last to people like me because you're too nice. I know how to step on people. And I'm like, and they put you in charge of everybody. That's awesome. Two of my kids around the corner where I couldn't see them, they hear all of it. By the time I get to the field, and you guys, if you've seen the movie, you know the first two games were run ruled, and we're right back where we were before I took the job. And this is coach who's not here before when I got the job. This guy came in during and <clears throat> stood on home plate, and I just said a small prayer. What can I do to help these kids? How can I push them without breaking them? How can I get these kids to dream? And the answer was so simple and so spontaneous. It, it didn't come from me. It's like, go down there, 
and teach them what your grandparents taught you. Now, sidetrack, at 15, my parents who were physically and verbally abusive agreed on one thing. They made a decision that was the best thing that ever happened to me that they never knew they did. They moved me to my grandparents' house from Miami, Florida to Brownwood, Texas. And I live with my grandparents and my father's parents. And I thought he came from somewhere <laughs> and they're gonna be just like him because the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree. He's physically and verbally abusive and horrible human being. And when I walked into my grandparents' house, I had two rules. If you do it, own it, own it, live up to it, move on. And number two, tell the truth. You don't have to remember what you said because the truth is the truth. And those were my rules. And they took a 15 year old who could have fallen off the tracks at any time and said, not on our watch. And they taught me so much about life in the three years that I lived with them, that that is now what I was teaching these kids. And so I walked down the left field line from home plate after that small prayer. And now I'm jazzed up. I'm trying to remember everything my grandparents taught me. All the kids are looking at the ground. They're sitting down in left field. They're not looking at me. They're not looking at each other and they're not talking and <clears throat> start talking about hopes and dreams and goals. 20 minutes in, I'm like, my grandparents would be proud. I said, you guys got to go out and live life. You can't let life live. You don't ever let anybody dictate to you what you're going to do with yours. You decide. And I'm like, now they're paying attention. Now they're smiling. Now they're talking. And that's when my 18-year-old catcher looks at me. He goes, oh, what about your dreams? I said, my dream is to watch you guys be successful in the classroom, successful on the field, graduate from high school, then go do whatever it is you want to do, college, trade school, oil field, whatever. But you decide. He goes, that's fine. And we love you too, but we think you still want to play baseball. I said, uh, no, sir, I want to stay married. Thank you very much. Coach, the way you teach us the game, we know your heart's still in it. We know what the other team's going to do before they do it. When you throw us batting practice, we can't hit it. And I said, that's because you can't hit. Well, why are you telling us to chase our dreams if you're not willing to do it yourself? And I said, you're 18. You need to shut up. <laughs> and I made everybody giggle. And Well, what if we start winning? I can't do that. What if we win a district championship? Now, another sidebar, I go back at 28. I had a surgery in which they cut out 85% of my deltoid muscle and my throwing shoulder. You will never, ever pitch again, ever. I'm like, cool. I don't care. I'm teaching. Now these kids can't hit me. And I'm like, oh, we just, we can't hit. That's it. Well, coach, if we win a district championship, which these kids have never been a part of in their life, in baseball, we win, you try out. All right, I'll find a try. I can embarrass myself for a few minutes if you guys win. That's great. They win. We're down by two runs going in the last inning of district championship. They score six. And I thought they were excited because they had won, and they were. And this is back before phone cameras and everything else. They're taking pictures and with their parents, the trophy, and each other, and they're hugging on each other. I'm leaned up against the backstop thinking I'm a pretty good coach. And then I remember that last line of my bus, uh, my contract. It said, and all other duties as assigned, bus driver. So I go back to the bus while the kids are celebrating and I start the bus. I warm up. I look out and this is something only a dad or a mom would know. Men don't cry, right? Until that doctor puts your first child in your arms. And then all of a sudden men learn how to cry. And so I'm excited because these kids are celebrating something not even they thought they could do. So I've got tears in my eyes watching these kids celebrate. Up on the top step of the bus comes my second baseman, who's our team clown, and absolutely the last kid that needed to see tears in my eyes. And when he saw me, he started giggling. So I said, shut up. And he pulls out from behind his back a baseball head, Reagan County Alice District, 1 2 champs, 1999. Everybody signed it. I cry harder. He hugs me around the neck and he goes, We did our part. Now it's your turn. Oh, no. Mm. I have to go do this. We get in a second round of the playoffs, lose the third game of three game series. Baseball's over. School's been over. The tryout I had found was at Dallas Baptist University. Six or 700 kids there to try out with every major league team. 
the one my father, who I do not get along with, the tryout he found was in my hometown of Roundwood at Howard Payne University. Jimmy, the Tampa Bay Devil Rays on June 19th, 1999, are having a tryout. 60 or 70 kids between 18 and 24. First ones that get there get to try out. You better get there early because they're going to count you twice. Well, thank you, Dad. And my kids who are eight, four, and one at a time, we go to drive an hour and 10 minutes to Howard Payne. I pull up down the left field line. I'm looking at all these kids get out of their car, tall, thin, athletic looking bodies, brand new gear. And I'm like, I look down at the gut hanging over the elastic band of my softball pants, which is not the picture in the movie. Thank you, Dennis. And I'm like, what, what have I done? I go up to the sign up table, Doug Gassaway. I think Doug was about 70 at that point. And he goes, how many kids you bring to try out? And I look down at my three, I go, three? He goes, no, two try out. And I said, I made a promise to a group of kids who do not believe in adults that if they did something nobody thought they could do, I would try to do something I know I can't do. It's going to be impossible. I know it. You'll get a good laugh. It's going to be embarrassing. But either you're letting me throw or I got to go find somebody else because I made a promise. When I get done, he looks at me with a serious face and he goes, why didn't you just shave your head like every other coach? I'm like, where were you three months ago? He goes, you're going to throw last. These guys have to throw from the outfield. They have to hit. They have to be timed a 60-yard run. Do you want to run? I said, I do not run. I'm a coach. I'll help you time them. And he did not think that was funny, but I did. You're last. All right. Kids and I have a picnic, play games, change diapers, get sunburned. Everybody tries out. Everybody tries out. I go out to the field. He hands me a baseball. How many pitches do you need to warm up? To embarrass myself, none. I just want to pitch quickly and run off the field. He goes, all right. And he giggled. He walks back behind the backstop. He picks up his radar gun. He goes, anytime you're ready. Young kid catching me, gives me a sign for a fastball. I'm lined up. Perfect pitch. I'm like, that's a good pitch. And then I look over his head behind the screen. His gas away, shaking his radar gun. I'm like, I do not even throw hard enough to register. That's worse than I thought. And when I finally get done, my one-year-old's crying. They've been in the sun all day. I go to get my kids, put them in the car, turn the air on. The first kid who ran up to me was a catcher. He goes, sir. And that hurt my feelings a little bit. <laughs> You threw better than anybody today. I said, so that's because nobody here could throw. He goes, no, you had them talking behind the screen. I said, I'm sure I did. Thank you. He goes, good luck, man. He shakes my hand. He runs off. So I put my kids in the car. I turn around and gas away to scouts there. He goes, I remember you. 1982, Ranger Junior College. You were a football star. Everybody wanted to make a picture out of it. I said, yes, sir. He goes, you threw 87 or 88 back then. Well, sometimes 90. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I don't know what you've done your time off, aside from eat, but the first pitch you threw without warming up was 94. Everything after that went up to 98. And the first thing that runs through my head is a happy dance. I'm like, I throw gas. And quickly followed by, you have been throwing 98 miles an hour at high school kids. You're getting sued is what you're getting. And he goes, look, you're old. Well, thank you again. He goes, but I got a call on a lefty with crazy movement and 98 mile an hour fastball. Don't be surprised if you get a phone call. I go home. It's not one call. It's 12. And they want me to come back in two days through again, see if I could throw that harder if my arm fell off. Call my high school kids. This is what happened. I've got a job in Fort Worth at a great big high school, the opportunity to work with more kids in a bigger environment. Or I go chase this dream. Coach, you told us if we ever had our dream in front of us, you chase it no matter what. And I said, well, I was lying. So two days later, it rained so bad they had to have me a brand new baseball. Every pitch, half my team were watching my kids and me throw. Sliding up to my knee in mud every pitch with lightning, and we've all got metal spikes on, which is awesome in the lightning storm. 98 every pitch. Signed a contract. It's a minor league contract. I took a pay cut from teaching to play minor league baseball. And, and Jim, you're not have, between 18 to 24 at this point. No, I am old. 35, so was I it? I go 35. 35. And so I go to rehab camp. Guys get well from injuries and surgeries. They sent me there to lose fame, the same as cookies and Dr. Peppers. And I've never been so miserable in my life. I throw everybody from the front offices there. It's good. They love it. 
now we're going to go run. But I was going to go shower. <laughs> Coaching mentality, right? 